Mike Gallagher watched from his second-floor bedroom window as his wife hugged Jake Williams, the man who always claimed to be his best friend, outside their home. She had returned with him from downtown, where they had spent many hours together. This was their fifth meeting, and as Mike observed and overheard their chat, he found their plan to disgrace him more. Christie's putative buddy plainly indicated his desire to spend a full week with her, but she shook her head in dismay after a moment's contemplation. Not for a week, Jake. Not yet, she said. Maybe a weekend, but only under one condition. What is the current condition? He inquired. You must have Mike cover our outing, she immediately stated, excited by her plan. He gave a laugh. He said, that sounds absurd. You are aware that I am significantly wealthier than him. I can easily pay any bill. No, no, she abruptly ended the conversation. You're missing an important aspect of this plan, so what is that? Jake lifted an eyebrow, looking at her with interest. She explained that it was done to belittle Mike. Come on, sweetheart, accept it. You enjoy mocking him, don't you? You mock him and make him feel useless every chance you get. Jake, this has been extended. You know he's my closest friend and I save it. The lover interjected, rolling her eyes. What I perceive is that you like misleading and demeaning him almost as much as I do, which excites me tremendously. She was so excited each time that she almost hopped in place. Listen, Christy, let us just finish this protracted joke, he said. Come with me, and we will leave the poor fellow behind. I want to marry you and stay with you forever, she gave a laugh. I'll tell you what, handsome, she eventually stated. Let him cover the entire cost of our scorching weekend of sexual encounters, and I'll consider your proposition. Jake sighed, slightly agitated, then smiled. I'm sure this weekend will be exciting, he muttered into her ear, embracing her and preparing to return to his car. I'll get in touch soon, but don't keep me waiting too long, he promised. She watched Jake drive away and waved at him before turning towards the house she lived with her husband, Mike. She began disrobing as she ascended the stairs after arriving. Christy entered the bedroom, locked eyes with Mike, who was sitting on the bed and threw her shirt on the floor. She smoked and stared at him while she unfastened her skirt, letting it fall around her ankles. She was now completely naked as this married woman frequently went on dates with Jake without underwear. Christy entered the bathroom and began checking herself in the mirror while leaving the door ajar. You most likely overheard our conversation, as she described casually measuring his reaction through the mirror from the corner of her eye. I'm going to leave you for Jake. We're going to have a scandalous weekend together, and you'll be paying for everything. Soon. I'll leave you for good so that I can marry him. I'd been paying the bills since we married three years ago. Mike reacted dejectedly. I believed everything was fine. I have done nothing except love you wholeheartedly and try to show it every day. Do you not love me? Christy simply snorted in disgust. How could I still have feelings for you? She replied mockingly. To me... You are simply a spineless pushover who allows. His best buddy noticed his wife hesitating to avert her look from the mirror and saw Mike turn towards the window, his shoulders dropping as he sobbed softly on the bed. She taunted him. Come on, be strong. So that's why you've been treating me so poorly these last few months. What about those pledges we made at our wedding? He asked quietly. Do you think the naive pledges I previously made will keep me back? Her voice was sarcastic. The failure and weakness that I see in this room do not justify my presence. Christy, please don't do this. I still love you. And your harsh words softened my heart. Mike's voice quivered as he gazed at her alluring shape. Even years later, he still looked at her with admiration. When he was filled with joy, he took her hands in his and placed the ring on her finger, just like on their wedding day. Christy noticed he was looking at her naked body with passion. She shook her head, disapprovingly. Don't even consider it a worm, she stated. I will not allow you to touch me again. When I have the desire, I'll summon a genuine man to meet my requirements effectively. What about you? She mocked with a sneer. Okay, so be it. I will let you sit in a chair in the corner and watch me pleasure myself in front of you. Christy was so engrossed in her daydreams that she didn't notice how his normally delicate features clenched, the skin stretched, his cheekbones tightened, and his fingers involuntarily formed fists. Curse you, Mike said faintly as he rose from the bed. Christy's hand, which was running through her hair, came to a halt halfway. 
Her kind and affectionate hubby had never spoken such harsh words to her before, straightening out and turning. She fixed her focus on him as he exited the room and began to down the stairs. I'm fascinated and a little frightened. Christy threw the hairbrush into the basin, dashed downstairs after Mike, and saw him go for the front door. Are you heading to the pub to drown your sorrows and complain to the bartender about your miserable existence? Or maybe you'll run to your mother and cry on her shoulder like a small kid, she mocked, standing at the top of the stairs with her hands on her waist and halting at the door. He looked at her thoughtfully for a few long moments, his eyes filled with sadness. He understood upstairs in their once shared bedroom that he had done everything he could for her and that he owed her nothing more. Goodbye, Christy. He finally spoke before slamming the door behind him. She heard the automobile door open and then close. She heard the engine roar and then saw him drive away. Where could he go? Christy pondered in uncertainty before shrugging dismissively. Let him go, she thought indifferently. Goodbye to the nasty stuff. She grabbed her phone and dialed a known number. Hello, darling, she cooed. My worm has slipped out, so why don't you come over and we'll have some fun? Are you leaving already? Hurry. I can scarcely wait. Three days later, Michael arrived at the residence and used his car's remote to unlock the garage door. He pulled in, slammed the huge door behind him, and grabbed his briefcase. He walked purposefully into the home. Christy was sitting at the kitchen table, reading the newspaper and sipping coffee at this early hour. Michael did not speak. He just passed by his wife, who raised her look and moved to his home office. Curiosity drove Christy to get up, stroll to the door of his office, and attempt to enter. She tried turning the handle, but the door was locked. Her spouse had never locked this door before, which was unusual. She pounded on the solid door, and when the latch clicked open a few seconds later, she turned. The Norburn appeared. She discovered him seated at his desk, eagerly reading a map of some location on his computer. Christy was aware that Mike was building a home project near one of the nearby lakes, so she believed the map was related to his business. What exactly do you need? he queried, raising his head sharply to meet her eyes with a serious expression. She took a step back and felt unsure. He had never treated her unkindly before, but she admitted to being pretty unpleasant to him recently. I... I was concerned, she said, successfully clearing her throat of the unexpected lump you left three days earlier. I haven't heard anything from you. I attempted to call your cell phone, but you never answered. Do you truly care about me? He inquired with evident contempt. Christy pondered for a while. Mike, was it genuinely her? He looked like Mike. It sounded like Mike, yet something was odd about him, as if he had changed within. Maybe she pushed him too far. She tried to softly touch his face, but he avoided her hand. Don't you want to hug your wife? She inquired, feeling slighted. It's been three days since I last saw you. He studied her for a few moments, as if she were an uncomfortable creature that needed to be examined under a microscope. Then he nodded his refusal. No, he responded, returning to his computer. Please shut the door on your way out. Christy was truly perplexed. Her spouse had never denied her affection and always embraced her whenever feasible. The man who was suddenly immobile in front of her seemed strangely remote. She retreated, softly closed his office door, and dashed to the main bedroom to get her phone. She dialed a familiar number and the man on the other end answered after the first ring. Christy confirmed that Jake had returned, but something is wrong. He seemed to have transformed into someone completely different. When he returned home, he did not even embrace me. Don't worry, lovely Jake soothed her over the phone. He's probably just accepted that you're leaving him and there's nothing he can do about it. I will be there tonight and we will manage everything. Allow me to speak with him momentarily and I will handle the situation. Okay, Christy said, not entirely certain. I hope you're right and everything is well by tonight, my dear. I'm sending you a kiss and all my love. Michael overheard part of her talk and smiled as he returned to his computer. Jake pulled up to Mike's driveway that evening. Christy opened the door, hugged him, and kissed him passionately as he walked in. Where exactly is he? Jake asked as they separated. Christy motioned to the office door. He's been in there all day, she said. Let me speak to him alone, said the lover approaching the office door. It won't take long as he didn't find it locked. Mike, here is Jake, your buddy. 
Can we talk for a little bit? Jake entered when the doors clicked to close. He gave a friendly smile and extended his hand, preparing to move forward. After a few steps, he came to a halt. The home's owner sat at the desk, reclining back in his chair and stared at Jake without moving. The visitor's smile evaporated, and his formerly outstretched hand gradually fell. Michael instructed, Close the door and take a seat, pointing to a vacant chair. Jake shut the heavy door and sat down while Michael gently poured himself a drink. Don't you intend to offer your pal a drink? Jake inquired as the office's owner tightened the bottle of scotch and returned it on the shelf. Michael fixed his attention on him for a minute, as if he was contemplating the meaning of friendship. Friend. Do you actually consider yourself my friend? Michael inquired. Jake was embarrassed, avoiding eye contact because Christy was sitting directly in front of him. This was not the docile, malleable man he was used to. Of course, Jake answered. I've been your close friend for many years, remember? Michael gave a little laugh. He mocked the term close companion as if savoring it. Tell me, my dear close pal, what kind of friend takes away his longtime friend's wife? Hello, Jake. I apologize, Jake began before being cut off. You're looking forward to having Christy, right? He inquired. Jake gave a nod. What is your value? In other words, how much do you believe she's worth? What exactly do you mean? Jake expressed his confusion. I don't understand. Don't be naive, Michael said with a smile. You're a skilled entrepreneur with excellent business sense. Otherwise, you wouldn't have earned such fortune. You're aware that every agreement has a cost. So I ask again, how much does Christy mean to you? I am not sure, Jake stuttered, perplexed. He was correct in his deduction that you appear to be offering something. Indeed, friend Michael confirmed, smirking bitterly. I like your new Bentley. How much did it cost? It cost me nearly $500,000, Jake boasted. It was custom made. And you paid the full price for it, correct? Michael inquired. Absolutely. Jake said that it was entirely my. Michael offered, spinning his glass and admiring the liquid shine. That would be a good place to start our bargaining. He toasted your health while taking a sip. What just happened? Jake elongated his words, disbelieving them. You want my Bentley and 25% of my assets in return for Christie? Michael nodded, his look severe. Along with 25% of your net worth, he added nonchalantly, and Jake's countenance shifted to surprise. He gasped when he realized it was more than $50 million. You must be joking or insane. That is $52,450,289, give or take, Michael said, looking at his computer. I know, I'm quite serious, he said. Jake leaped from his seat and paced the room, agitating Lee while Michael sat back, lazily examining documents, unconcerned about Jake's anguish. Jake eventually stopped pacing and fell in his chair. His gaze conveyed tension. So you want my automobile and a quarter of my assets for Christie? he confirmed. Jake realized that the Christie sitting in front of him was no longer within his control. Why should I even think about this? I already have, your wife, Michael said with a sneer, printing a document. He said, I'm giving it to Jake. Consider what will happen if the board and stockholders see this. Do you believe you will remain as wealthy and influential after this scandal? I doubt it, he remarked, pouring another scotch. Jake accused them of extortion after reading the letter outlining their affair and how they had belittled Mike for a long length of time. Think what you want, but my offer is valid until noon tomorrow. After that, it's 50% plus the majority. Christy, if you wish, you can share your business. Michael declared, that's my price. This constitutes robbery, Jake objected, plainly offended. You won't get away with it. Michael mused as he sipped his drink. You desire, however, for reasons I cannot comprehend, but that's my situation. I am willing to accept it, and I guarantee you'll spend your days together without my intervention. Isn't that what you want? Well, yes, Jake confessed. I'd love nothing more than to be with Christy for life, Michael smirked. So there you have it. Accept my terms, and I'll even arrange a celebratory supper for you both, he suggested. I need some time to consider things through. Jake answered. Michael gave a nod of agreement. I'll give you until tomorrow at noon. And don't forget, he said firmly, clasping his fists and tapping his fingernail on the face of his watch. Time has elapsed. 
The old friend drew a handkerchief from his breast pocket and quickly patted his cheeks and neck, damp from the thrill. Now please make sure the door is shut behind you as you leave, Michael said, signifying the conclusion of the conference. I won't keep you any longer. Jake Rose looked bewildered and walked out of the office on stiff legs. The office owner glanced through the curtain as Jake and Christy exited the house. He smirked and made a few calls. Christy arrived home shortly before dawn in her partner's vehicle. Michael had overheard their conversation in the driveway. Just image, Jake said, in just a few days. We can begin our new life. I was freed from Mike. Allow me to come inside and enjoy the flavor of these breakfast pastries. He kept clasping Christy's waist hard. She laughed and pulled his hand away. She told him that it wouldn't be long. I can hardly wait to see Mike serving us. Christy gathered him and watched Jake drive away. Then she entered the house and observed a light in her husband's study. She wondered if he had been there all along. She tried the door, but it was locked. Might she have called through the door? I won't leave, Michael's voice came to her. Christy paced near the locked door for a few moments more, listening, before deciding not to apply any further pressure. She made her way to the main bedroom, genuinely concerned about her husband's strange behavior. Jake sent Michael a brief note the following morning. Agreed. He swiftly responded with the offshore account information and stated that he would oversee the fund transfer to assure the transaction's completion. A few hours later, Michael confirmed that the requested amount had been completely deposited, and he promptly diverted it, spreading it among different other accounts under his sole control. After settling his finances, he texted Jake and Christy, Dinner is on me tonight. Be here at 7 p.m., he then left to get the fixings for the evening meal and returned an hour later. Michael adored cooking and preparing meals, and tonight's goodbye dinner for him and his guests was particularly emotional and melancholy. Christy arrived home about 6 p.m. that evening and went straight into the kitchen. Until tonight, she was completely unaware that her husband was proficient in the culinary arts. Nonetheless, it showed that he was very conversant with cooking techniques. The aroma of whatever he was cooking was quite appealing, I had no idea you knew how to cook, she exclaimed, clearly surprised. He raised his eyebrows and leaned on the table with both hands. You actually don't know much about me, he said, wiping his hands with a cloth. Perhaps if you had spent more time here rather than fleeing to your affair, you could have learned something. At the very least, I learned my lesson and figured out how to defend myself. Prepare yourself. Your visitor will be arriving shortly. She tried to kiss him on the cheek like she did the day before, but he turned away, avoiding her touch. Christy hurried from the kitchen and dashed upstairs, a single tear streaming down her cheek. What have I done? She doubted herself. Jake came minutes before seven and rang the doorbell. Michael answered the door and welcomed him inside right away. Jake pulled the signed documents from his folder and gave over the Bentley keys. Prioritize business over pleasure. Right. Michael smiled. Jake responded with a cough, as promised. My throat is parched from the excitement. May I get a drink? Thank you for upholding your end of the deal. I'll have some excellent champagne ready for you and Christy to celebrate soon. Michael mentioned tucking away the keys, excited to drive the new Bentley. Christy descended the stairs quickly, glowing and stunning in a short, backless black dress that revealed a lot. Michael noticed she had removed her rings. She approached the dining table and Michael politely offered her a seat. She smiled at him as she took her seat, but he didn't return her smile. Jake sat as well, his smile as wide as a Cheshire cat's. You look lovely, my dear. He complimented her, kissing her hand and staring at her fondly. And I see you've taken off your rings. That's excellent. She smiled again as Michael retrieved two flutes of champagne and placed them on the table before them. He returned to the kitchen and soon returned with a large platter in his arms, having lifted the cover. A puff of steam escaped, filling the room with the delightful aroma of Michael's lasagna. Mike, it smells heavenly, Jake said, adjusting the napkin on his lap. Maybe you have overlooked your true calling. Michael remained silent as he served each of their plates. Christy picked up the utensils but stopped to look up at him. Will you not join us? she inquired. Michael shook his head while filling their tall glasses with champagne. No, he answered. This celebratory meal is also meant for you, alone. I don't want to disrupt your meal and mutual enjoyment. 
Michael took a step back and watched the couple sip champagne while toasting to their bright future. They soon lost awareness of him as he withdrew to his study with a wry smile. Michael sank into a chair. He considered checking his watch right now. It didn't take long before he heard two soft thumps and the clatter of a dropped fork. He takes a break from his studies. He noticed Christy and Jake slumped in their seats. Jake's face was pale as he leaned against a half-finished plate of lasagna, his arm dangling near the floor. Christy's form, with her dress hiked up and revealing the tops of her stockings in a seductive manner, slid slightly from the chair. Her head sagged. Okay, he considered. They'll be out for at least six hours. Michael changed his clothes and got to work, undressing both lovers, intertwining their bodies, and securing their limbs together. He retrieved a wheeled cart from the garage and wrapped their unconscious bodies in heavy chains, adding weights for extra security. He put ball gags in their mouths to keep them quiet in case they woke up before he arrived at his intended location. The task was difficult, but he managed to fit both into a large canvas bag that he had specifically purchased for this purpose. Michael used a dolly and a portable lift to move the bag of lovers into the trunk of his Bentley, which he then closed and locked under the sprawling stars in the quickly dimming sky. He drove away from the city and arrived several hours later. He heard shuffling and muffled sounds as he loosens and pulls the bag open slightly, revealing utterly bewildered heads peering around in panic in the enveloping darkness, leaning over them. Michael held a little stun pistol. If you promise to keep quiet, I'll take down the guides and answer any questions he poses, but scream and you'll surely regret it, he warned, brandishing the stun gun. They nodded in agreement, and Michael released them from their gags. Where are we? Christy asked, afraid. Who are you and what is going on? Her voice broke with apparent panic. Yes, Jake, she answered. What exactly is going on here? Based on my GPS, we are right where your spouse committed suicide. Michael accused his wife of cheating. What? Michael, did you kill yourself? Christy screamed, her eyes widening in shock. What exactly do you mean? He shared everything with me. How cruelly you have treated him over the years, neglecting his needs, betraying him and shaming him. Among other things, Michael disclosed, I do apologize. I neglected proper etiquette. You might think I am Mike, but I am actually his identical twin, Michael. Not only do we share genetic material, but we also have the same name and middle initial. Jake and Christy looked at him in surprise, like two deer frozen in the light of approaching headlights. I warned him about you, Christy, but he was too blinded by love to listen. You have no idea how prepared I was, Michael indicated, bringing his thumb and forefinger together to step in and speak up. At that point, the officiant inquired as to why these two should not be married. But then I refrained, and I've regretted it ever since, he admitted regretfully. Were you present at our marriage ceremony? Christy asked, puzzled. I do not recall seeing you. Michael explained that he chose something that would not draw attention. You see, Christy, although Mike and I appear to be similar on the outside, our personalities are very different. He was a gentle and compassionate soul who always sought harmony with others and avoided conflict at all costs. Above all, he adored you and was willing to go to great lengths to ensure your happiness. In contrast, I saw through you right away. I was convinced you were a treacherous person who would betray him at any opportunity. Call it a hunch, a sixth sense, or an insight. It's completely irrelevant. I wished for Mike's sake that I had made a mistake. He sighed, clenched his fists, and looked away. Christy, still in disbelief, speculated that he had never mentioned a brother. Michael admitted, Yes, because I begged him not to. Technically, I should not exist. I would explain why, but then I would have to remove you. He joked before laughing. As you may have noticed, it is quite dark here, making it difficult for you to identify where we are. He continued after his laughter died down. In case you're wondering, we're in the deepest part of the bottomless lake. Mike recently took his own life at this location. He could not bear the pain you caused him and chose the quickest way out. I tried to talk him out of it, but he was beyond comforting. Christy cried. Mike, did he really kill himself? She asked her voice quivering. My God, I never wanted him to die, she cried. Damn hypocrite, Michael replied with disdain. You explicitly told him you didn't love him. That's equivalent to pulling the trigger yourself, he charged, turning to Jake. And you're claiming to be his closest ally. You have not responded to my question after all this time. 
What kind of a friend are you seducing? She is his wife. Why so quiet? Perhaps you are now feeling remorse, he remarked sarcastically. The harsh reality is that you were never really his friend. You took advantage of his feelings, betraying and demeaning him whenever possible. But you told me Christy and I would be together forever, remember? Jake demanded his voice be rough, glaring intensely. Become enraged. You cheated me. You cheated me, he accused. Michael just chuckled. You're right. I did say you two would be together for the rest of your lives. And I wasn't lying about it, Michael insisted. I simply admitted that your life expectancy would be significantly reduced, so your future together will be turbulent, but brief. You'll even pass away on the same day, just like in those romantic stories. Michael smiled broadly. And it will be well earned. Damn it. Please do not do this to us after you both plotted against my brother. Christy begged with tears streaming down her cheeks. Michael looked at her with a cold and dreary expression, telling me that he pleaded with you in the same words before you embarrassed him and betrayed him with your lover. Michael stated that he was devastated when he told me what had happened. But then you simply scoffed in his face and told him to get used to the cuckold role you had planned for him. Now it is time for you to face the unavoidable. You're a crazy lunatic, she screamed and wriggled inside the sack. Let us go at once. You are not going to get away with this. Michael simply shrugged. Perhaps not. Perhaps so, he added. However, once your farewell note is found on your computer, it will be irrelevant. He gave a laugh. Nonetheless, I must admit that it is a touching and heartfelt letter. But let's shift the subject. You're probably aware that the bottom of this lake has never been found. It's not called bottomless for nothing. And the weight attached to the chain, securely wrapped around the two of you, will ensure a quick plunge. Michael reached out and shook the clinking chains, as if Frozen were watching him in terror, trembling uncontrollably. I believe you will last no more than sixty seconds before blacking out. You might even stay a few minutes longer after that. Michael sighed and smiled as he said goodbye. Unfortunately, we must forego a priest, solemn music, and a formal ceremony this time. Nevertheless, I hope you have a wonderful honeymoon. Michael finally loosened the sack and with all his might, flipped it over, plunging the couple into the water while flailing and screaming in terror. Bon voyage, he murmured, as the silvery cocoon of chains faded into the dark depths and numerous bubbles rose to the surface. The bubbles quickly stopped and silence returned to the lake's dark surface, interrupted only by a shimmering trail of moonlight. Michael started the softly clattering boat motor and returned to the bay pier, guided by the pier lights that cut through the early morning mist. He moored the boat, turned off the engine, and jumped into the Bentley, hidden in the deep shadows of the docks, turning the ignition key to the gentle hum of the engine starting up. He reminded himself to burn the sack to eliminate any traces of its previous contents. He then took out his phone from his inner jacket pocket and sent a brief text message. Here's the next story. Tom was sifting through new test data, a tedious but necessary task for him and his team's month-long effort on the test vehicle. Despite the boredom, he found himself correlating and tabulating information for analysis in the middle of the task. His phone buzzed with a text notification, but he paid little attention to who sent it. He only noticed the alert after taking a break from his work and looking away from the screen. Curiosity peaked. He picked up his phone and discovered an unfamiliar number with a local area code. Though tempted to dismiss it as spam, he reconsidered, wondering if it could be a colleague's unregistered cell phone number. When he opened the message, his confusion turned to shock as an explicit image appeared on his screen. It took him a moment to process the unexpected content, a close-up of a woman's private parts, clearly showing recent ejaculation, while reading the accompanying text. Take a closer look. You've still got time. Bradley at 6 p.m. He initially dismissed it as an ineffective attempt at solicitation, finding amusement in the situation. However, a closer look at the image revealed a tiny detail that shocked him. Tanya doubted himself as he desperately sought to disprove what he saw, a mole near the woman's private parts that was unmistakably his wife's. However, the evidence only served to strengthen his conviction. As he recalled Tanya's supposed whereabouts on the way to Boston for a critical work engagement, questions raced through his mind. However, 
he was presented with an image that suggested otherwise. The message's timing clashed with Tanya's scheduled arrival in Boston at 4.30 p.m. as the clock approached 5.15 p.m. Although she usually checked in on arrival, it appeared that she was preoccupied with her team's plans, despite the emotional upheaval. Tom chose to respond to the text first before taking any further action. Not particularly unique, but quite predictable. Who is this? How did you acquire this image? Is it expected of me to meet you at Bradley's as he wraps up the day? He made a strong choice to go to Bradley's. He was determined to find answers, so he texted Tanya. How about your flight? I'm heading out for a bite. Give me a call when you are available. He wanted to keep things low-key and gather information surreptitiously. As he walked toward his car, his phone chimed again. Assuming it was Tanya, he checked his phone, only to see a response from the unknown sender. I'll be there, but I am confident you will find someone more intriguing than me. Feeling overwhelmed, he dashed to his car while checking the map on his phone. Bradley's was 30 minutes away, but it was already 540. He'd arrived shortly after 6 p.m., unsure of the importance of timing, but hoping not to miss the person the texter had expected him to meet. During the voyage, his phone vibrated again, this time with a message from Tanya. It's a crazy moment with the crew. We'll call you later before bed. Love you. He shoved thoughts of their chat to the side. His attention was focused on his meeting at Bradley's and the mystery surrounding the texter's knowledge of his wife's arrival at 612. His heart pounded as he parked, because the texter had not provided any information on who to look for. He assumed that anybody wanted to meet him would approach him. However, the mention of someone more fascinating being present concerned him the most. The texter appeared to have access to information he lacked, and he was afraid of falling into a trap with no other way of discovering the truth. The image of his wife's carnal parts caused him great distress. He absolutely trusted her, and their intimacy was enjoyable, or so he thought. However, the only reason for someone having such a vision was unsettling, and he was just minutes away from knowing the truth. A terrifying prospect. Stepping inside, he let his eyes adjust to the dim illumination. Unfamiliar with the pub's layout, he paused by the entryway to look around. A large eating space was ahead, with a bar on his left, choosing a seat at the end of the bar. He requested a draft and studied the eating room. His eye was pulled to a man who had just accepted his drink order and was walking across the room to a table of happy people. Tanya sat at the table wearing a small black dress and pearls, taking a drink from the well-dressed man. Her grin is beautiful. He moved automatically approaching the table where Tanya sat just a few steps away. When she saw him, her countenance changed from warm smile to wide-eyed dread. Undeterred, Tom approached the table and grabbed a fistful of the well-dressed man's hair with his left hand. He pushed back hard, causing the man to spill his drinks and stumble backward, yelping in pain as Tom hauled him past. He released his grip and prepared to strike him with his right hand, but the man's quick withdrawal put Tom out of reach, and he landed on the floor. Before Tom could take another step toward Pete, he recognized him and warned him to stay down. Pete, unkempt and soaked in alcohol, complied without saying a word. Turning back to Tanya, Tom realized that the table had gone silent. Familiar faces looked back at him. Members of Tanya's team who had shared meals and gatherings at his home, he reflected that team devotion transcended betrayal with the exception of one individual who had chosen to divulge the truth, and he momentarily considered identifying them. He regarded the concept as worthless. Tom informed Tanya that he was returning home and urged that if there was any hope for their marriage, she should accompany him now. Tanya nodded in response. However, before she could rise, he motioned for her to stop and ask for a moment before leaving. He addressed Betty Wilson and Bob Thornton, who were seated nearby. He asked Betty whether Bill felt she was in Boston and Bob if Alice agreed. Their avoidance supported his assumptions. He wondered whether the entire squad was engaged. Realizing that at least one of them was present, the drive home was a blur that ended abruptly in his driveway. Inside, he grabbed a beer and sank into the living room, thinking about his acquaintances who were familiar with Bill Wilson and Alice Thornton, but unfamiliar with the other couples present, his anxiety growing. He considered contacting Bob or Alice, but decided against it. Instead, he sent them a short message. I just found that Tanya's trip plans had altered. You might want to follow up on that. 
he left the decision of further research to them, feeling a sense of closure in the middle of pandemonium. About 20 minutes later, he heard the garage door open and Tanya pull into the garage. He waited in the living room. She entered, still wearing her LBD but without the provocative shoes and jewelry. She walked quietly into the living room and sat opposite him on the sofa. He kept quiet, knowing the value of silence in any conversation. He was determined to keep the silence for as long as it was required. Tanya was quick to speak up. It's not what you think, she continued, but he motioned for her to pause. You don't know what I think about tonight's events, Tom responded. I don't require a detailed explanation. We are both engineers, and we understand that there is no genuine or objective answer to any broad question. It is frequently only an attempt to rationalize negative results, so I'm not going to inquire why. Let's start with something easy. How long? How many times? Aside from individuals that cheat at the table, how often do our buddies find out? Am I known as your betrayed man among your co-workers and our friends? No, Tom, it's not like that. Tanya grumbled that our team's travel plans had been delayed, and instead of returning home only to travel again the next day, Pete proposed we stay in town for a day off before returning. I did not see the entire team present. Where was everybody else? Tom inquired, when we got the news. She revealed that some of the crew elected to stay at home one more night before meeting us at the airport tomorrow. But you decided to deceive me, he pointed out. You appeared rather close to Pete. Is there anything going on between the star engineer and the wunderkind program manager that you would like to share with me? For starters, Pete is okay. He also persuaded the proprietors of Bradley's not to press charges. She remarked in a pleasant tone, and his eyes widened in surprise at her commitment. I could care less about your colleague. If he hadn't tripped, I'd punched him. I'm not concerned whether or not charges are filed. I've spent the night in jail before. It is irrelevant. Furthermore, it could make for interesting testimony, he said with a half-smile. Do you adore him? Tanya paused to gather her thoughts. He could tell she was thinking. Yes, silence was an effective technique, and his thoughts hurried to fill the gap in their talk. Again, it did not appear that things would turn out well. He is not my boyfriend. There is simply nothing between us. Yes, I should have told you of the change in plans, but it seemed insignificant whether I was in town or Boston. You were not expecting me, but I remained loyal to the team. We were just having dinner before retiring to our rooms. There was no cause for you to act as you did. You have absolutely embarrassed me in front of my colleagues, she exclaimed, hoping to fake her way out of the issue. He unlocked his phone, opened the text, and pushed it over the coffee table to her. He could tell based on her facial expression. She remembered the photo and the context, leaving no space for denial. This time she began speaking without bravado. He retrieved his phone, launched a voice recording program, and slid it inside his shirt pocket. Tom, our team is... She paused, looking for words. In many ways, the community is extremely close. Most of us, she began. We have a small group that meets regularly. They were all in Bradley's. We were the ones who put in extra work on the proposal. You are aware of how much time I have spent working on our pitch. I'm not sure exactly when it started. It was some time after Pete became prime minister. Tanya stated that we worked closely together, and I was drawn to him, and things just developed from there. He interrupted, saying there was no need for an explanation. Falling asleep is not a natural occurrence. Decisions are made knowingly. We both realize this, so please do not insult me. So, nearly six months. He answered one of his queries. That's when Pete joined, correct? She nodded. The team, he proceeded. All of you. He faded off without mentioning it. I mean, collectively. She nodded again. Pete remarked that it promotes trust and team cohesiveness, is this what prompted all of you to establish a business commission group? Now you're being impolite. It is more than that. Tanya stated firmly, I feel a stronger connection to Pete and my team than ever before. He sensed disaster ahead. Unfortunately, Tom warned that your crew may be changing soon. What have you done? Tanya gave a gasp. Tom involving others will just increase the damage. Let them make their own decisions. We need to focus on ourselves. Tanya, I cannot remain silent and be complicit. I care about Bob and Alice. He responded, In fact, I like them a lot more than Betty and Bill right now. I texted them about the change in plans. They decide how to handle it with their spouses. 
I can live with my decision. Tom, we have America's most productive team in history, she virtually screamed at him. You profited too. Our team meetings were on Wednesdays, but that didn't mean you missed out. I never denied you access to me when you needed it, so I slept with my teammates a little earlier. You never saw the photo you showed me? Do you want to know about it? She sneered. Was that right after Pete finished inside me? Yes, he came in. Your lovely wife. You don't see Betty. She took the image right before she landed on me. So now you know. You never had seconds or ate another man's seed. If you're not sure, it didn't happen, right? Tom listened in disbelief as the scope of the deception and his own stupidity unfurled before him. Now, just because you're aware, because your fragile ego has been injured, do you want to toss away everything my team and I have accomplished? Tanya growled, her rage rising. Tom felt his heart rate rise as Tanya vehemently defended her team's problematic dynamic. His own rage was intensifying by the second. For a tiny minute during his journey home from Bradley's, he considered the possibility of forgiving Pete just once. However, that assumption was quickly debunked. He didn't need to hear it anymore, and he definitely didn't want to. But Tanya persisted. No, sir, we will not let you off the hook. You'll text Bob and Alice to let them know you heard from me and that we're trapped in Atlanta but have reservations for the morning. Betty and Bill will stick to that tale, and you're going to support them, damn it, she said. This transaction involves millions of dollars and your upset feelings are meaningless. Send the text and then we can talk about our future actions. Discuss our next moves. Tom responded. It cannot be discussed. Are you going to leave now? You and your warped squad, including your ringleader Pete, can carry on as you choose. We've finished. I'll contact a lawyer this week to get the ball rolling. It's a clear 50-50 split. You keep your retirement and I'll keep mine, Tom declared. But go. You have made reservations in town. Use them. Head to Boston and celebrate another triumph for you and your teammates. Tanya pleaded with Tom to send those texts. Her tone is considerably softer now. If we lose Betty or Bill before the presentation, the corporation may lose millions. You and I could be missing out on tens, if not hundreds, of thousands of dollars in commissions and incentives. Imagine where we could go with that money. It's just you and me. Forget about it and restore my loyalty. Please, Tom, do not let your unreasonable anxiety over inconsequential encounters derail us. Pete claims I'm on the fast road to executive position. All I have to do now is keep producing results for a few more years. Don't you desire that for me? For us? She implored. Tanya, please leave. Tom managed to mutter something before being punched in the back, knocking the wind out of him as he collapsed to the ground with a knee pressed against his back. Do not hurt him. Tanya interjected. Too much, she added. So you're still undecided about breaking my nose? Pete taunted Tom as he leaned up close to his face, pinning him to the floor. Tanya must have a bug, Tom was thinking. I now know which team she is really on. We'll see whose nose is broken. Pete smirked. Take his phone and type those awful texts for him. We don't have time for such crap. Someone helped them up from the floor. Only one individual. He claimed to be injured prompting the person behind him to use great force to help him stand. This provided him with the vital information. His kidnapper was a frail office worker who wheezed as he struggled to get Tom off the ground. Tom was recovering his breath after being taken by surprise and refocusing on the situation. In contrast to Pete and his well-groomed salesman, Tom's crew worked in the field with the 160th Special Operations Aviation Regiment, which was stationed in Fort Campbell, Kentucky. Although his group of engineers could not equal their caliber, spending time with the crews on test missions led to the team being invited to enhance their physical condition under the supervision of seasoned workers who were taken to missions in Tom's team-modified aircraft. If these men appeared on your doorway, it meant the end of your life on Earth. Tom and his crew built the equipment required to enter and, more critically, depart hazardous areas. They were proud of their modifications, which helped to ensure successful missions and the safe return of everybody involved. The 160th and its frightening passengers greatly appreciate the extra effort put in by Tom's crew, with Master Sergeant Troy Baker standing out as the most terrifying figure. MSG Baker was well known within his neighborhood. Everyone from trainees to high-ranking officers paid him the respect he deserved for leading his soldiers on operations around the world. He was famed for leaving no one behind. 
During their first mission in Colombia, MSG Baker urged the inexperienced platoon leader to stay close as the far DC ambushed their group, cementing his reputation. Baker felt the ELT was doing well for a rookie until he noticed him on the ground, suffering from a head injury. The medic stated that he had checked for vital signs and that he had gone to the top. Baker knelt and lifted him into a fireman's carry alongside the medic, repeating that he was gone. Pop. Baker responded to the medic's assessment, stating that it could be true, but he was still heading home with them. The medic regarded him as if he had lost his mind. Consider the more than five-kilometer journey back to the light through dense forest. They'd be lucky to return unscathed. But transporting a deceased person seems like a risky decision. Baker told him that he had anticipated the medic's thoughts. I do the same for you, Billy. Stay nearby in case I need you. What followed became legendary. After they returned to the base, the medic notified the doctor that the light had died. The doctor nodded and took the pen light from his pocket. The medic looked in awe as the dead pupils contracted in the harsh light of the pen light. The doctor then asked the medic whether he wanted to change his diagnosis. As they hurried, the revitalized LT into surgery. He was timeless. He rarely spoke, but when he did, everyone listened. He was a relic in an era of convenience and disposability. He was neither. He was precisely built and one of a kind, and he appeared to have a special fondness for Tom and his team during the long periods of downtime between missions. The MSG acknowledged his gratitude by teaching Tom and the crew some simple yet efficient hand-to-hand -hand defensive tactics. He cautioned the engineers that it is best to be prepared. I recognize that the most serious hazard you're likely to face is a malfunctioning copier or a terrible paper cut. However, if you continue to work in this field, you may end up in some interesting places. So if you happen to encounter one of the colorful locals, you'll have something useful to rely on, Baker explained to the gathering. But let's hope that a paper cut remains the scariest thing you've ever encountered. Tom controlled his breathing and appeared submissive in the grip of his abductor, recalling the fighting skills taught by the MSG. There may be times when you feel powerless and can only tolerate the smacking. It is unfortunate, yet it happens. The trick is to realize that even while you're being smacked, you can fight back. You simply need to outsmart your assailant. Tom remembered the lesson and quietly resisted, gradually wearing down the lone man's power. Give me the phone, Tom, Pete demanded. I am staring him down. Now you know I've been with your wife and that every guy on the team has had his way with her. Ignore this tough dude. Act, Tom. You are nothing but a wimpy, servile nerd. Do as we say and you may still have a chance with Tanya. When the squad is not employing her, don't forget about the luxuries you can enjoy with her. A bonus that should alleviate the agony. Who knows? Tanya might even purchase you a commission robot for times when she's busy. Tom bit his tongue while Pete took joy in humiliating him and forcing him to comply. Pete demanded to know where it was. I see the silhouette of the phone in Tom's shirt pocket. He grabbed for it with his right hand. Tom took a strong stride back with his right heel, striking his captor's shin and causing him to stumble in pain while flexing his arms. Tom wrenched away from the grip as his prisoner yelped and slumped under his own weight. Pete's eyes brightened with awareness, and his right arm sprang straight out. Tom rolled his shoulders as instructed by the MSG. Driving his clenched fist into the center of Pete's space with full force, he felt bones fracture beneath his fist as a flood of blood gushed out Pete's nose, knocking him to the ground. He turned around to identify his attacker. Bill lay on the floor in despair, grasping his leg. He sobbed, saying he thought his foot was fractured. Tom stepped hard on Bill's foot, causing him to scream in agony. Tom stated that it should eliminate any uncertainty. Turning his gaze back, he noticed Pete on the floor, hands covering his face, attempting to raise to his knees and approach him. Tom leaned in close to his ear and commented that it appeared like his nose had taken the hit, adding that he was unwilling to take one for the team. He then landed a strong blow on Pete's temple, knocking him down cold, his adrenaline pumping and his breathing ragged. Tom searched the living room for Tanya. He dropped to one knee after feeling a stinging hit on his back and neck. He spun around and confronted the new attacker. Tanya stood before him, clutching a cast iron skillet. Her swing missed grazing. Tom sighed and rose to his feet. He roughly took the pan from her grasp. 
Tanya appealed with Tom, saying they could still save the situation. She begged him to think about the money he would be giving up and promised to halt his extramarital affairs by cutting them off. She urged they return to their previous relationship. He rubbed the back of his head with his left hand. Tom looked at her, astounded by her abrupt shift. He compared her to the shape-shifting alien from John Carpenter's The Thing. Adapting to each new difficulty, he smirked at the concept, mistaking his smile for assent. Tanya moved to embrace Tom. He held her back with his left hand. Then, after a brief moment of thought, he punched her nose with his right palm, breaking bone but not knocking her unconscious. Tanya shouted out and sank to the ground. Tom commented that it stung like hell. Describing tears, impaired vision, difficult breathing, and blood everywhere, claiming that it worked every time. Tanya voiced her distress. When asked why he punched her, Tom unapologetically answered that he did so because he was able to. He continued to record the incident, believing that he had enough proof to support his conduct, regardless of the potential unfavorable portrayal. Tom examined the room, reflecting on the MSG's advice regarding decisive action, Noting Bill's distraught mood and Tanya's attempts to stop the bleeding from her nose in motion, while others remained still. Tom acknowledged the success of saving someone and complimented the MSG. In the aftermath, Tom was frustrated with the implications for Loverboy and Mr. Bill, mourning wasted possibilities and potential financial losses. He considered the ramifications of involving the police. He decided to postpone the call in order to continue questioning Tanya, so he kneeled next her. Tom demonstrated how to treat the nosebleed, but as the adrenaline faded, he experienced a sudden loss of energy, sitting across from the woman he assumed he knew. I am questioning her conduct. Tom questioned the degree of Tanya's dishonesty. Expressing disappointment at the betrayal, he inquired about her ambitions, notably her desire to become vice president. Tanya stated that it would have been worthwhile if Tom had agreed to her plans. Tom expressed sadness for the incident's setback, and went on to question the viability of their relationship and the continuation of dishonesty. Tanya recognized the likelihood and continuation of dishonesty. Tanya told Tom that Pete had cautioned her about his hard ethics and idealistic ideals and that she needed to break free from his influence in order to succeed. Tanya reacted to Tom's question regarding when Pete gave her this advice, implying that he was unaware of key aspects of her relationship with Pete. Despite Tom's quiet, Tanya continued to share her thoughts on job progression. She said that following Tom's advice for career advancement resulted in only a few accolades. It wasn't until Betty offered advice that she discovered what really worked for women in the workplace. Tanya claimed that engaging in sexual relationships for professional progress was not only effective, but also delightful. Tom, who was still recording the talk, evaluated this information and became inquisitive about Tanya's history of events. Tom wondered whether her involvement in such things began before Pete entered the scene. Tanya, frustrated with Tom's comprehension, said that she had instigated similar measures at the company's Christmas party a year after joining Chromatica. She has consistently emphasized her devotion to this method. Wait, are you also sleeping with the boss? Art? Art? Vandalism? Tom asked incredulously. Yes, Tom, Art, Pete, Bill. Is there someone on the team who can assist me progress my career? It costs me nothing to offer some closeness, and it's easy to manipulate you men when I can lead you around by your fantasies, especially if you reveal a little cleavage, and I can take you wherever I want, she explained. Even though you may believe you have everything under control, we informed Art of our location as we arrived. Right now, he's assembling the rest of the team and planning a cover story for our absence. They will have to make their pitch without us. However, the extra work with their buying managers should pay off. Do I actually want to hear this? He wondered. What the heck? Why not? Extra effort? Tom prodded. Tanya, you were always a go-getter. It was so simple. I hate to even call it an effort, she said, laughing. What is the old joke? The worst intimacy I've ever had was during the bidders conference. It was straightforward with the men. We had to get imaginative with Brenda, the selection board's token woman. It's funny. I can even seduce women. However, as a kicker, I included old Pete over there. She was situationally bi-curious, as I remember. Her condition improved at the same time that my tongue began lapping at her with promises of more to come when we started working together after the contract was awarded. 
Yes, we have the selection board covered. So why is all of this happening? I mean, if everything is set up, why use strong arm tactics? Tom asked. That was Pete's idea. The stupid. I told him to calm down, that I'd return home to please you and be back in time for the trip. But he had to go full alpha. Look what it got us. So, rather of being the face of the victorious team, I'm back to working with Art. As previously said, this is fixable, but it'll set me back. You wouldn't have purchased me so cheaply, he explained. Tanya said, maybe not, but I would have made the flight. You are not going to make that flight right now, he declared, recalling Pete's apparent intelligence. He assumed Tanya must have a transmitter. Art, are you listening? I am about to call the cops. I'm sure there are a few felonies involved here. We haven't even begun to follow the rabbit hole of deception. Is that a federal contract, Tanya? Tom asked rhetorically. Yeah, the feds have a dim opinion of how did you word it. Extra effort. I'm sure you have excellent lawyers in all areas, but perhaps there is another option. He let it dangle for a bit later. Tanya's cell phone ringtone was, Hail to the Chief. Art? She asked over the phone. Of course, I will put you on speaker. Tom Art's voice emerged from the speaker. First, I'd like to apologize to you. Pete's actions were a major error of judgment. I tell you that the board will deal with him assertively. Thanks, Art. That puts my mind at peace. I'm glad to see that you and the board take violence and fraud seriously. Tom, these are all regrettable claims. Lawyers will benefit, but no one wants to disturb the boat. We could have to pay a fine. Pete and Bill complete community service, but you will eventually be divorced and half as affluent, Art explained in a businesslike approach. Do I detect any awe in this story, Art? Tom inquired. Tanya always believed you were the most clever of the two. Nonetheless, I'm pleased to have hired Tanya. Yes, Tom. There is a distinct sense of amazement, Art continuing. Tom, Comerica has superseded you in your wife's affections, and when you found out and questioned it, you were treated quite poorly. Most shabby. Shocking. Tom joined in. Tom Art continues. Instead of phoning the cops, as you mentioned, suppose we could reach an agreement. I just sent a photo to Tanya's phone, not me. One of my tech boys is here. They say they disappear after viewing. Take a peek. Maybe that will restore some goodwill. Tanya opened the snap and turned the phone to Tom. He spotted the words, Bank of Grand Cayman, and a number. A very large number. And when will it be deposited? Tom asked. It is already there, Tom. You received an email with the account number. This has been a terrible day for you, Tom. This may be a difficult decision for you to make, and I do not disregard your emotions. Tanya is an extremely desirable woman. So be it. However, one cannot bring emotion to the bank. Can one? One cannot. Tom concurred, adopting Art's upper-crust, clipped manner of speech. Comerica will cover the cost of your divorce. You can never reconcile. I think we can all agree that Tanya will file. She will request her personal belongings and her retirement. He thought for a moment before responding. On the one hand, he may take a principled stance and disclose the entire scandal, letting the chips fall where they may. On the other side, he may simply walk away. Art had just given him five million reasons to do exactly that. Does Comerica employ a medical staff, Art? Tom asked. Yes, Tom. I think we have several physicians on retainer, Art responded. Good, Tom said. You should load a couple people into a limousine and send them over here to pick up your squad. Are we in agreement now? Art questioned Tanya. Who? Tom answered. Exactly. Art agreed. Are we finished, Tom? Art asked. Hello, Art. Tom ended the call. Tom put his phone away, turned off the recording app, and returned it to his pocket. I knew you'd see things our way, Tom. We can still be friends. When this is over, we'll be friends with benefits. She summoned what she thought was her most winning smile, but it couldn't undo the damage to her nose. Her eyes were turning black and the blood was crusted under her nose. Dried drips down to her chin. Tom found the sight comical and allowed himself a smile. Once again, Tanya misread his smile for agreement and leaned in to kiss him. Tom extended his right hand to halt Tanya, using it to gently push her back until she landed on the couch with a thud. Expressing disdain, he questioned the notion of wanting to kiss her, leaving Tanya hurt and looking up at him, declaring his decision. Tom insisted that she remove whatever she wanted by the next day. Walking toward the door, he stopped beside Bill, inquiring about his injured foot. Dismissive of Bill's complaints, 
Tom kicked him in the groin, causing Bill to curl up and moan. Approaching Pete, who had managed to sit up, Tom assured him he wouldn't physically damage him. Pete, relieved, smiled, but it quickly vanished when Tom's foot applied pressure to Pete's groin, rolling onto his side in pain. Pete watched as Tom exited the room. He got into his car, unsure where he was going, but food and shelter were high on the hierarchy of need scale for a good reason. He grabbed a burger from a takeout place, checked into a Red Roof Inn just outside of town near the freeway, and fell asleep as soon as his head hit the pillow. Despite enduring numerous physical strains from various injuries, he rose early the following morning and reluctantly got out of bed while preparing motel room coffee. His phone chimed and he eagerly grabbed it. The text message came from the number and he opened it promptly. Sorry for yesterday. I can meet TGIF at the mall. Noonish, I'll wave you over to seats at the bar. I'll be there, he replied and poured the lukewarm brown water from the coffee maker carafe into the paper cup with determination. He set up his laptop, gearing up for some online banking reflect on his college days, a time predating his relationship with Tanya. Tom recalled his economics professor's advice to maintain an offshore account for unforeseen circumstances with his professor's assistance. He established a bank account in the Cayman Islands, which he fondly referred to as his go-to-hell fund. Over the past decade, he diligently contributed to it, and now he boasted an impressive sum of close to $50,000. Tom felt a sense of pride knowing that his go-to-hell fund was about to receive a significant boost. Tom accessed the secure website for each bank. With his passcode and several keystrokes, he transferred the bulk of Erica's payment into his personal account, leaving $100,000 in the original account. After a shower, a change, and getting ready, he headed out to meet the mystery texter. Tom entered TGIF just past noon. As he entered, he noticed a man waving him over. The man appeared to be about Tom's age, well-dressed and handsome. Tom approached him. I believe you sent me a text, Tom said as he sat down. I'm sorry for how it turned out. I don't know if there was any clean way to tell you, the stranger began. Why don't you start with who you are and your connection to Tanya? Tom responded. I was on the team. I left the army after eight years wounded in action and had a lengthy recovery before being medically discharged. I joined Chimerica about six months ago and was assigned to Pete's team around three months ago. While talking to a friend about the job, I mentioned working for Tanya when he asked for her full name. We realized we had a mutual friend, and he asked me to watch out for Tanya as a favor. At first, everything was great. I was warmly welcomed to the team. It didn't take long to find out why he started about two months in. Tanya approached me. She's extremely attractive and compelling, but when I asked her about her ring, she just smiled and told me you were okay with it. I wasn't, and said so. That started the deep freeze. After I turned her down, I got all the undesirable assignments and nothing but grief from Pete. I called our mutual friend back and told him about Tanya approaching me. He told me about you and thought that pimping your wife for pay seemed out of character for the man he knew. He believed there was more to it than Tanya let on and that you needed to know. Pete sent me the pic when they were trying to get me on board with the team. Kind of a prize I could expect if I went along. Let's just say I don't agree with their methods. I resigned yesterday and sent you the text. Our friend Tom asked Troy Baker if I hadn't met Troy. He replied, then paused a moment before continuing. Let's just say he helped me out of a scrape when I was a green light. I'm a favor too. Don't we both? Tom agreed. What are you planning to do? The stranger asked. Art pretty much laid it all out for me. I could get the cops involved. And yes, Bill, Pete, and even Tanya would face legal problems. But with his lawyers, it would all end up as a bump in the road. We made a deal. You might think I'm selling out. And maybe you're right in a way. But they stole the only thing I had that was irreplaceable. If I can't make them pay legally, well, at least I can make them pay. It won't bring Tanya back, but I think I may find she's less irreplaceable than I thought. I have a trip planned. Tell Troy thanks for everything. I won't be going back to work. How about you? Tom asked, finally. Well, Troy always spoke highly of Baxter, Inc. Now that you're gone, they might just need another engineer. I think you'll find they do business a bit differently at Baxter. Maybe more to your liking. Challenging. But the fringe benefits won't, compared to what Tanya's team was offering. Tom smiled, expressing his acceptance of the arrangement. The stranger stood up. 
prompting Tom to do the same with a simple nod to each other. They left without exchanging any further words. Fast forward to Monday. Tom had just completed the check-in process for his flight to Costa Rica as he contemplated the upcoming relaxation in Tamarindo. He headed toward security, spotting a mailbox. He pulled out an envelope from his pocket addressed to the DOJ in Washington, D.C., containing a thumb drive. With the recording, he thought it might pique their interest, considering the possibility that Art's legal team might not be as formidable as assumed. Tom dropped the envelope into the box before proceeding into the security line. Update nine months later, seated at his usual table in the cafe, Tom received mail from Anna, who brought him his cerveza. Thank you, dear, he said, raising the bottle to his lips, holding the envelope. He wondered who had found him, not going to great lengths to stay hidden. Finding him in a little town on the Pacific coast of northern Costa Rica would have required resources beyond the ordinary guy's reach. His first thought was that Art's people had found him letting the envelope sit at his house for two days. He was fairly certain it wasn't a bomb. Yet. You can't be too careful, Carlos. Tom called out to the cafe owner, Denise Dos Cogolo. She said you're Tom. Tom handed over the envelope and stepped back a few paces. Can never be too careful. He thought as Carlos cut open the envelope, he handed it to Tom, who thanked him, took another pull from his beer bottle and turned the envelope over. Several sheets of paper fell onto the table, picking up a note that said, Thought you would find this interesting along with a phone number. The number? Tom thought Troy would have the resources to find him. I can live with that. Flipping the other piece of paper over, he found a copy of a newspaper article with a picture. The photo depicted Pete, Bill, Tanya and Betty, being led out of the Comerica building in handcuffs. The headline for the article read, Four, Indicted in Multi-Million Dollar Procurement Fraud. He smiled. Maybe Art's lawyers aren't everything he thought they were. He said to himself, a habit he picked up since his Spanish was weak and English wasn't widely spoken. He liked to hear English conversation, even if it was just him talking to himself. Ana otra cerveza, por favor, he said, holding up his empty bottle. See, si, Mr. Tom. Gracious, Anna, he said as he accepted his beer, took a swallow and looked out at the deep blue Pacific. Thank you for spending the time to hear today's story. If you enjoyed this essay, please like it and subscribe if you haven't already. If you have a tale to share regarding your or someone else's circumstance, please do not hesitate to contact me. Take care.